record on the computer. Live on Facebook. Okay. A little moment of silence. Do I press admit all or you're doing yeah. that? Yeah, no, yeah, you can press admit all. I'm opening the Facebook page. Wonderful. Hello, everyone. As you're coming in, I'll just give a few minutes for everybody to get settled before we get started. It'll just be a couple of minutes, but I do welcome you on behalf of Career Advising and Transition Services at McGill School of Continuing Studies. Thank you for joining us, and I already know you're not going to regret it, and you're going to find this time was well spent. So I see that you're all there, and we're going to start. Hi again, everyone. My name is Rosalia Felice. As I mentioned, I'm from McGill School of Continuing Studies, specifically CATS, which is Career Advising and Transition Services. We help students with exactly what the title says, their career and career transitions. And some of you in the audience, I imagine, are there and welcome and welcome to everyone else. And I'd like to introduce actually my team. Some of the team members are here and I'd like them to um, maybe say hello. We have Nayo. Hey, hi, nice to see you all. <laughs> Deanna. Hi everybody. Emily. Hi everyone. And we have Valerie who will be right back. Val oh, you're there Valerie and Valerie. I didn't- Hi everyone, welcome. <laughs> Wonderful. So welcome to Power Skills. Today was so special that we had two keynote speakers. We already had Ryan McCarty, that was wonderful. And to say that I'm happy to welcome Madeline is an understatement, I would say I'm giddy. Um, and I'm just thrilled that she can be here. And it's so nice because we're talking about resilience and we thought it would be really interesting to have that perspective from an athlete. And that's what Madeline is, she's an athlete and a performer and actually she says that she likes to talk now because she wants to inspire other people to achieve peak performance in whatever it is that they do she's a figure skater with Silk du Soleil and from those of you from Montreal <laughs> we know a lot about Silk du Soleil and she played the reflection in Crystal which was a skating show which of course due to COVID like everything else um, kind of stopped but she'll talk about that um, she is a USFA triple gold medalist, among many other accomplishments. So even though you're all muted, and I, I, I invite you to, to talk through, uh, to us in the chat, and the, and the team here, who I introduced before, they'll take care of the chats, but we'll actually answer messages at the end, if that's okay with you. And without further ado, and maybe we can clap by doing this, or however it is that you want to welcome Madeline, but please, everyone, welcome Madeline Stavron. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you so much, Rosalia. That was uh, quite the introduction. Um, I'm just so happy to be here with Kat. Thank you for inviting me and um, asking me to talk about resilience. I mean, this is a, a big thing and skill that um, any athlete needs to have, but I think everybody could use a little bit of resilience in life, especially um, what's happening right now with this pandemic. And a lot of us are going through transitions and hard times. So um, my hope is that by sharing a little bit of my story, I can give you the tools and um, yeah, the tools that um, I've used throughout my athletic career um, that's helped me bounce back from injury and continue to do what I do. Um, so I'm just gonna start the slides. All right, so as Rosalia said, um, uh, my name is Madeline Stammen and I am a professional figure skater, coach, and choreographer. I have about 20 years experience in elite competitive sport and performing in shows. Um, some highlights of my performing career, I performed on board cruise ships on and off for about four years and, and saw the world and performed in over five continents. Um, I also did a few stationary shows overseas, but I'm perhaps most proud of um, being involved in the very first ice show that Cirque du Soleil ever made back in 2017. Um, I created the character of Reflection and the show was called Crystal. So. I want you guys to see a little bit more about what the show was. Um, I'm gonna show you a, a video of our world premiere back in 2017 in Montreal. So 
It's going to be really exciting to see their reaction this evening. Stressé, euh, bah, de la pression, normal. Mais euh, non, ça va, je pense qu'on est prêt. Je pense que, ouais, on a bien travaillé, on a travaillé fort tous les, ces derniers mois, ces dernières semaines là, et puis on en a remis une couche euh, ces quelques derniers jours pour euh, vraiment que ce soit. Euh, en tout cas, on va essayer parfait pour la première. The public is the best part of the performance because their reaction it lets you know how how you're doing and, and I've done my job well if I can make somebody laugh or cry or react in any way. So, that's the best part. I'm incredibly 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 proud and excited to introduce Crystal to Montreal. A year ago when we were writing it, we had storyboards and and scenarios and I feel like when I see the show now, I see all of those storyboards. I see those first Scripts, and that's an amazing feeling to have thought of like a little little seed of something and watch it come to life on such huge scale. We're gonna remember this day for the rest of our lives, and we're spending it together. And I'm really honored to spend it with all of you, amazing, amazing, amazing people. Everyone, be safe, have fun. This is the beginning of an amazing journey. Thank you all. Merci. Woo! the world of skating and skaters because this is a brand new world and it was such a fun time to mix and not to do a show that we've done like with circus people but to have a new family we join join together with the acrobat and i think it's uh, we open the door and i hope people will do more shows like that and we had a blast and you guys you were so good yeah. i don't want to do any more shows in my life this is the end of my career <laughs> Okay, so that was Crystal. And as you can see, we had um, a great culture there. Um, we were a really tight knit group. And after that premiere in Montreal, we left on tour. So we did a tour of North America. Uh, to give you a little bit more of an idea what tour is like, it's extremely fast paced. So we do a different city every week. Uh, we perform Wednesday through Sunday. Sometimes it's anywhere from one show to three shows a day. And especially in the beginning, we spend a lot of hours at the rink. Almost sometimes it was about 12 hours a day, um, but it was well worth it. And I really enjoyed being there. So about a year into being on tour with this show, I started to experience a lot of pain in my knee on landings of jumps. Anytime I would cut and pivot, uh, my knee was starting to give out and the pain was slowly starting to become um, worse and worse. So we had an MRI done on my knee just to see what was going on. And at the end of 2018, I found out that I had torn my ACL for the second time um, on, in my, on my landing leg. So this was, the knee I needed to be able to stabilize when I came down and jumped onto one foot. So this was devastating news. And I was sent home uh, to Chicago to have surgery. And little did I know this was going to be a recovery that I had never experienced um, before. So in the fall of 2018, I was sent home. I 
was expecting about a six, a six month recovery. Um, I had surgery and the day I came home, um, I was put in a, a brace all the way up from my thigh to my ankle. And for somebody who's used to moving all the time, um, I was used to this fast paced tour uh, lifestyle. Suddenly I was incapacitated. I couldn't even walk by myself. Um, I needed to be driven around. Um, I needed help getting into the shower. So it was a wildly different change of pace than what I was used to. So the rehab process went a little bit like this. I would go into physical therapy about three times a week, especially in the beginning. I really just needed time to heal. Six weeks later, I was able to take the brace off, learning how to walk again, learning, uh, teaching yourself to have the correct gait. Um, slowly just waking up these, these muscles in my quads that I had, I basically had watched my right leg shrink down to the size of a toothpick. Um, so basically what happens is you need to, to completely rebuild this muscle back from scratch. So about five months in, I had been doing physical therapy for a while and I was finally cleared to get back onto the ice. This was spring of 2019 and I was so excited to be close, um, close to my goal, which was returning back to the show. Uh, we were all very hopeful about it. I got moved back to Montreal to be at Cirque headquarters and, and train with new coaches, um, and I was put back on the ice. But the more I skated and the more load we started to put on my knee, the more my knee started to react. I I uh, was experiencing swelling so much to the fact that they needed to pull me off of the ice in summer 2019 and basically take me back to ground zero. So as soon as I thought that I'd be going back to the show after six months of work, I was basically taken away from the sport again and back to rebuilding the strength in my legs. So that's what we did all summer at IHQ. I worked with strength coaches. I was doing um, strength training three times a week. I was going to the pool to recover. I was eating super well. I was trying to sleep anything that would help my muscle grow faster um, and get back to the strength I needed. And I was just improving at a snail's pace. I'm talking maybe 1% a month. Every time it seemed like I took three steps forward, I took two steps back as far as pain in my knee and not being able to, um, for my leg to, to withstand weight. So in the fall of 2019, we decided to, to change our, our approach. They sent me back to my home in Chicago uh, to be closer to my surgeon. And I got a PRP injection in my knee. So this was supposed to help with the swelling um, and help my tendon heal a bit more. But the problem was, was the injection also irritated it more. So I had to once again go back to ground zero, give my knee some time to rest, and then again start building, building, building up the strength. Now this time I gained a little bit more momentum. So about five months, six months into now I'm going to PT five days a week. I'm going to cryotherapy and getting in these frozen tanks and and in these sub-zero temperatures to try and control my inflammation. Um, I finally started seeing results here nearly a year after I initially thought I was gonna return. So in the spring of 2020, just this past spring, I was finally able to get back onto the ice again and returned to Montreal to IHQ to be reintegrated back into the show we were shooting for summer. I could, I could taste my return on my lips, I was so close and so excited to get back to this, this life I missed so much. And I was at headquarters for maybe two weeks, the pandemic hit, everything shut down and the show was canceled for the rest of the year. <laughs> it was super surprising. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave the story there for a second because this is what that process felt like life's fist punching me down, me falling back down, trying to spring back up, spring back up. And this is when the idea of resilience comes into play. So I define resilience as 
the capacity to recover quickly from challenges and setbacks, or process of adapting well in the face of, of stress and adversity. So I think the main point I wanna stress here is that life is always going to throw challenges at us. And how resilient we are is how fast we can adapt to those challenges that are thrown at us. So how, how fast can you bounce back? Um, another thing about resilience is, is I believe that it's trained like a muscle. So this wasn't the first time I had I had, had an injury. Um, I was plagued with injuries most of my early career. And that's actually how I got to where I am today. So this is a muscle that you can you can build. And thankfully, I've had some amazing mentors and coaches that have helped me throughout the years of my competitive career. So my goal today is to by sharing these experiences with you, give you some springs, give you some springs and sort of break down the process of what being resilient is. So you can take some of these tips into your own life, whether you're somebody who's going through a career transition or, um, or somebody that's going back to school or, or maybe you've had a, a job loss because of this pandemic. These, this process and these types of tools you can, you can bring into your, into your everyday life, um, life. So finding resilience. I believe it happens in four steps. When, when you have an unexpected challenge coming your way, there's four things you can do to sort of get through this process. The first thing is accept, accept everything that happens. The second thing is reorganize. The third is drive, which is my favorite. Excited to talk about that. <laughs> And the fourth is reflect. So we're going to go through um, each one of these things and kind of talk about what it is and how you can do it. So acceptance. This is a this is a quote from one of my favorite favorite books. If you haven't read it, I would highly recommend it. It's called The Power of Now by Eckhart Tolle, and this is the quote: "Accept, then act. Whatever the present moment contains, accept it as if you had chosen it." Always work with it, not against it. This will miraculously transform your whole life. And this is a pretty simple concept, acceptance of whatever that is. Things happen, you, don't, you can't control it, accept it. Well, it's an easy thing to say, but it's a harder thing to be done. And the quicker that we can accept everything that happens to us, the faster we can retaliate, make a plan, and move forward. So that's the first step, which is accept. The second step is reorganize. So this is our, our goal setting and our planning. So once we've accepted the situation, we, we sort of have to get reorganized and either establish new direction. So each time that um, my knee either reacted or our current plan wasn't working, we all had to go back to the drawing board and say, okay, what can we do now to get us closer to this, this, um, this result that we want? So when we're goal setting, especially in athletics, but I think it applies to, to everything, we want to set SMART goals, which are goals that are specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and timely. So specific. Specific means that we're setting a goal that's not ambiguous. We're very clear about the destination we're trying to get to. Measurable is your KPI, so your key performance indicators or, or what you're using to measure your progress and your success. Attainable is do I have the resources to be able to achieve this goal? Realistic is does it fit into my life? Am I really going to be able to accomplish this? And timely is basically creates urgency. So you set a date that you want it to happen. And yes, it creates urgency while, while you're driving. So that's reorganizing, it's goal setting. So for an example, if you're a student and you're setting a goal and, and sort of not a very smart goal would be, I want to be a better student. Okay, that's a great goal, but it doesn't tell me much. A smart goal would go along the lines like this. Um, I want to get straight A's in most of my classes by the end of the year by studying three times a week. So that goal's specific, 
it's measurable. We know how well you're doing because it's graded. Um, it should be attainable and realistic and it's timely because you said you wanted to do it by the end of the year. So that's a SMART goal. The third step, which is my favorite, and I, I think that when you think of athletes, this is really the step you think about because you think about training, you think about putting in the blood, sweat, and tears. Uh, the third step is, is driving, which is basically taking this, this, this thought out plan, this idea, and putting it into action. Now, a little story about driving. About halfway through my recovery process, I was getting really, really frustrated, especially that summer where I didn't feel like I was making a lot of progress. I know here I've shown that progress looks like it happens in a staircase, but it, it really doesn't. Sometimes we make three steps forward, we go three steps back, and it's, it's really a nonlinear process. So I was getting um, really, really frustrated with, with everything that was happening. Uh, luckily, I can't take credit for this image. One of my coaches, Veronique, showed me an image that was really similar to this. And she said, Madeline, you are so focused on the outcome. You, you see our little image here, um, Bob looking up at his goal with his head in the clouds. She's like, you're so focused on the outcome that you want that of course you're gonna get frustrated. We want you to focus more on this red arrow here. So you need to focus on the process. What actions can you control each day to get you closer to where you want to be? And that was a huge breaking point for me in this whole thing. Um, I had heard focus on the process before, but, but never like this. Um, so I think that's one of the, the main things to think about when you're, when you're driving, when you're taking action to achieve something. It's focus on the process, which means focus on the action, the little things each day that bring you closer to the place you want to go. There's other aspects of, um, I guess, tools you can use while you're driving, which um, are positivity, accountability, and self-care. Um, positivity, to me, is is your inner dialogue. So if things aren't going your way, how, how what, what's, your, what's your inner dialogue like? Are you encouraging to yourself or are you, being, or, are you not full of hope? Accountability um, is another aspect of driving. So are you accountable to yourself? Are you accountable to your coach? Who's helping you stay on track as you're driving towards this, this destination? The last one is self-care. And I am a huge proponent of self-care. This comes down to proper sleep, mental rest, um, nutrition, hydration, all of these things in an athlete's life and in anybody's life really are important um, to being resilient. If you're not taking care of yourself, you're not going to be able to um, bounce back. So back to the story of this injury and this this process that was supposed to be six months and turned into a year and a half COVID hit I was sent home and this time it took me a while to to accept what had happened I had worked so hard to get back to somewhere that didn't even exist anymore so so it took me a while to go through the next steps but first I had to except what happened. Okay, the world shut down, rinks are shut down, gyms are shut down. This is what's happening. What can I do now? All right, I'm gonna reorganize. Um, I have a gym in my basement, I can go train there. I have some, some coaches in the area that I can reach out to to help me. I still had a job to do, which was to get better. So since then, um, I trained in my basement for a while, rinks have reopened, I'm back on the ice, um, I have support um, around me, and I'm happy to say that I am probably a month away from being cleared from this injury. So I'm so close to my goal, I feel strong, um, and it is, it is a happy ending. So um, I'm, I'm looking forward to, to driving the last little bit of my own goal that, that, that I'm working towards right now. So the last step, in our bouncing back process is um, reflection, which I think is 
really, really important to do, and we often skip it, especially goal-oriented people. I think sometimes we can go from one goal to the next, to the next, to the next, and never take time to really reflect on what happened, how we did, and and how we can how we can either repeat the process next time or improve it. So these are some questions you can ask yourself when you're taking this time to reflect on the process of, of bouncing back from anything. It's how did I do? So even if it wasn't the exact outcome that you expected it to be, which for me initially was going back to the show, but now I know it's just being healthy and being able to do my performances again. So how did I do? What, what was it in my control that I reacted well to? What was good about it? Or what can be improved? What could I do a little bit better next time to, to make this process um, a bit smoother? So those are the four steps of resilience. And I can't finish this without talking about something that's a bit late. It's, it's a layer deeper than these four steps. These are all actions you can take and things that happen throughout the process of bouncing back. But there's one sort of secret weapon and aspect of my own life that I pay a lot of attention to that I go to when things get real hard and when I need to dig deep. And I'm gonna show you a video that depicts this. It's, it's a video we made um, a while ago. It, it, it shows the everyday training of an athlete, but there's this beautiful voiceover and it talks about this, this deep motive inside you um, that you need to dig to when things are super uncertain, you're in a transition, or things are getting really hard. So I hope you enjoy this. Uh, Madeline, we have no sound. Is it, does this have sound? There's no sound. Oh, no. No. Um, hmm. I, I'm going to stop the share real quick. Yeah. And let's see if we can. Um, see if we can retry this. Sure. Thank you, Madeline. Mm -hmm. All right, let's try again. There we go. Can you Good. can you hear? Yeah, okay, excellent. great. Thank you. I am compelled to move. Inventing, relearning, improvising as I go. And I go. Rising and insisting myself upon the world. My teacher, my student. I am compelled to move by something impossibly deep, yet intimately familiar. As close to me as my fingertips, my breath, or my blood. Vitality. I am compelled to move. I am compelled to move, and I am moved by the compelling notion that I am. And I am. More than my body alone, I am. The power welling up in me from that deep I know and know not. Oh, it stopped a little bit too soon, but that's okay. Um, hmm, okay, we'll go to the next slide because uh, for some reason we're having trouble with the video. It's probably just referring, but actually was posted in the link so people can go and view it on their own. Thank you to um, Halima Hi. who posted it. So thank you, thank you so much, Halima. Awesome, so if you wanna see the rest of the video, uh, you can go, yes, on, on YouTube, it's posted there. Um, but one, what I wanted to bring to focus was, was this voiceover, and I'm gonna read it out loud. Um, I am compelled to move, inventing, relearning, improvising as I go, and I go, rising and insisting myself upon the world, my teacher, my student. I am compelled to move by something impossibly deep, yet intimately familiar as close to me as my fingertips, my breath, or my blood. Vitality. I am compelled to move when I'm compelled to move, and I'm moved by the compelling notion that I am. 
and I am more than my body alone. I am the power welling up in me. From that deep, I know and know not. I move and I am movement itself. I am life, I am renewal, I am energy, I am living connected energy. So I think, I didn't write this poem, but it really captures this inner purpose that you can, um, you can dig from when things get tough. It's, it's that deep, I know. And I call it my secret weapon. Um, these, this, this inner purpose is, is a combination of three things. It's, it's your values, this inner purpose, and your personal mission. So I don't think a lot of people take, I know companies do this to establish a cohesive direction with their employees, but as a, as a person, what are your values? Have you ever, um, have you ever written those down? What's your personal purpose and what's your, your personal mission? Um, so for me personally, I have these written down on a piece of paper <laughs> and I think about these things when, you know, life seems really hard or I, or I don't feel like I'm making progress or um, I'm really, really needing to dig deep. So your values are what you deem important in life. It's your behavioral compass. It's, it's a set of principles that guide you. Um, your purpose is why you do what you do. What's your why? What's your motive? Um, why are, how are you compelled to move? Um, and your mission is the change in the world you'd like to see. So this is quite deep stuff. And even for me, I'm constantly revisiting these things. I'm constantly rewriting them depending on what I'm doing. But this type of self-reflection, I think is so important to really feeling fulfilled, motivated, and these things ground you when you really need um, to, be, to be resilient. So if there's anything that you remember from this, I want you to ask yourself um, two questions. You can pull out your phone, write it in a note, pull out a piece of paper, um, but, but what compels you to move? In other words, what's your why to whatever you're striving towards right now? Could be school, it could be a career transition, um, any of those things, what's your why? Um, and spend some time on this. It, some, sometimes it, it, you don't know right away, um, but I kid you not, answering these questions for yourself um, will make you a more resilient and grounded, grounded human. Um, so I'd love questions now. Um, I'll throw it back to Rosalia. I don't know if there have been questions in the, in the chat box, but I'd be happy to um, answer any that have uh, come along throughout this presentation. Thank you, Madeline. First, I want to yeah. thank you for that so much. Um, we definitely had a question. I was just going to ask you to turn, to stop sharing your screen so we can yeah. see you. <laughs> be nice. Of course. Wonderful. Thank you. Yes, there's a human behind the voice. <laughs> yes. Madeline, I'm going to start with the first question because when I saw that first video, I can't imagine being in something like this. It just, I think it created a trance with people. People were saying how, how inspirational it was, right? And it's just that, that piece of video of you in the, in the production. How do you let go of something that, that, that just seems like the most incredible experience? Like how, and I know you talked about how you did it, but going back to daily life must be... Yeah so tough like how do you even relate to everyone around you you're in this completely different world it's it's such a good question and i honestly think it's something that a lot of athletes struggle with um i touched on it a little bit in the beginning where you're you're used to this pace of life and this this thing that you do every day and suddenly it's it's gone i, I will say it's it's a tough transition but that's why i brought up at the end like sort of your inner purpose and your values, like those are the things when you feel like that, that everything's lost, you, you ground yourself in those. So um, even though, you know, for the last year and a half, I couldn't be a performer anymore. I know that some of my values are hard work and discipline and my family. So I had the opportunity to be back with my family. I'm never home. 
Um, so I chose to focus on those things because there are so many more aspects in life than, than just being an athlete. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, but it must just be, I, I mean, really, I was in a trance and that just must be an incredible, an incredible transition. We, a lot of people have been asked, obviously, people want to see that video again, which we posted. Also this, so you all know, this video will be available and we'll send registrants the link. So thank you. I did want to tell you, Madeline, somebody was at that show from that recording and that was Jay. Jay, are you here? If you're here and you want to unmute yourself and you want to just identify yourself, that was pretty funny that somebody said they were so, asking. Oh, oh, that's God. awesome. <laughs> I was there on the first day. I'm amazed. <laughs> you want to see the cup I'm drinking? You, that's a crystal cup. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, that makes me so happy. Oh, Thank you. Meet. Oh my God. Thank yeah, you. I have tears in my eyes. Oh. I'm telling you, I was we connected to you when we saw the show, and my whole family was there. It was amazing. Oh my God, the, the show was amazing. Oh my gosh, thank you. That like that gives me goosebumps and brings tears to my eyes that me you too. enjoyed it so much. So thank you, seriously. Wow. Um, I would have to see that you saw that. I loved it. <laughs> <laughs> so you're a little starstruck right now right i was starstruck when i met madeline too and i didn't even see the show <laughs> i was so thrilled to see her oh my god i saw her oh, you won't believe how you changed <laughs> oh how nice so mature and the presentation was so amazing Honestly, that's, that means so much to hear from you because oftentimes when we're, um, when we're on stage, like we never get to interact with, yes. um, with the people that come and see the show. So it's, it's, it's an honor for me to, to hear that from you. Seriously, it means so much to me. Thank you. <laughs> if I could, I could have run to the stage. <laughs> Maybe they allow us to do that. <laughs> this, this session applies to everybody, Madeline. This is for everybody. Yes. Because we all connect to you in, in some ways, right? It's really inspiring. Thank you so much. Thank you. Absolutely. And even in our first keynote, we had, you know, the, the how, how sport really is a metaphor for life. And that's why it's so interesting to have an athlete talk about resilience from their perspective because it is widely applicable even though our lives are completely different. So we have a lot of questions. Madeline, do you have some time to answer them? Of course, yes. That's why oh, I'm here. Adriana, by the way, uh, also said she saw it live. Her favorite show on ice so far was really greatly done. The story will just carry you away. So I'm happy you're getting some love from the audience. Um, Thank you. Uh, yeah, that's <laughs> um, some here's a question. Um, oh, there's so many. Here's one. How do anxiety and mental health illnesses affect resilience? And how do you overcome them or, or or does it make any kind of difference you know and for, from your perspective of course wow this is i mean um i could do a whole nother presentation on um on mental health and mental resilience um i had that's actually a huge subject i talk about a lot which is mindfulness um i started for for me personally um when i started with cirque it was the the biggest role i'd ever done and i was um I was, exp I was really, really nervous for a lot of the shows. Um, so I actually am a religious meditator. I, um, anywhere from five to 20 minutes a day, um, I have the Headspace app, or I just have this app called Insight Timer. Um, and just to sort of ground me, calm my mind, especially before performances, um, I, I use meditation and mindfulness techniques. It's it's a huge topic that I could probably drone on about for um, <laughs> for another hour and do a whole nother presentation on. But um, yeah, I would say the key things I do for my own mental well-being and, and mental recovery is is meditation. Oh, Rosalia, I can't hear you Thank anymore. You. Oh, there we go. Okay, were you muted? Yes, I was muted while you were talking, but a few people actually asked about mindfulness and meditation uh, in the question. So thank you for addressing that. So this is obviously a lot of people are wondering if you use that as one of your, yes. your power skills. So fantastic. 100, 100, 150%. Amazing. Yes. 
Thank you. And now I love this question from Leanne. What made you decide to transition from competitive figure skating into show performance? Wow. Okay. Um, I would say that there were two things. One was actually I this this injury I just talked about. I was plagued with injuries my entire competitive career. Um, I still to this day don't really know why, but um, oftentimes I would train, 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 and right before um, a big event like like regionals, um, I would get hurt. I had tons of knee and ankle problems. So part of the reason why I retired early from competing was because of those injuries. Um, Another reason is because I was just always very artistic and a natural performer. Um, so when I had the choice between further pursuing uh, competitions and going to shows, it was a really, really natural thing for, for me to go into, into performing. It was right up my alley and my strengths. Did you miss competitive? When you moved from competitive to show performance, did you miss the competing? No. no, so interesting, wow. I just, I became a better skater when I joined shows. It, um, it taught me a lot about, since you go from competing maybe five, six times a year to doing a performance every single night. Um, so it just, it made me a better, more consistent skater. Suddenly being under pressure every day, I, I started, you start to practice a bit more like you'd be competing. Um, yeah. So you never, you never thought that when you were starting competitive uh, figure skating, did you ever think that you'd want to do shows? Did that ever occur to you? Or? You know, my mom used to joke. I didn't know. I guess she, she used to joke um, when she'd sit and watch me skate with the other parents that I was going to end up um, the back end of a horse in a nice show someday. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Okay. So um, I always knew it was a little bit of an option, but in those years when I was competing, I was, I was focused on, on trying to do that at the time. Amazing. And now we have a lot of questions. I know we're not going to get to them all. So is there a place that people can, can follow you or um, I know you write and you do all kinds of things. Is there a place that yeah, maybe we could share because we might not get to all the questions? Please. Yes. Um, my Instagram, I, I post a lot on my Instagram about, especially my recovery journey. Um, I sort of call it athlete diaries. So you can follow me. It's just my name, Madeline underscore Stammen, um, on Instagram. Um, I also have a website. It's just my name again, www.madelinestammen.com. Um, and you could send me a message on there. I'll, I'll respond. If you have any questions, I love to connect with people who have either seen the performance or, or come to these talks. It really means a lot to me to, uh, see what, what resonated with you guys and just even to to know what you'd like to know more about so please reach out thank you and i'm sure you'll get some because we're, we're overwhelmed here with questions uh, actually i'm going to ask a question that was asked while you were talking at the beginning and it's just funny it's a little bit of a different take so the person that greg asked are flips not allowed in competitive skating but they are allowed in shows what do you think about that and are they dangerous um, it's awesome. And that's part of the reason why I love being in shows because we get to do whatever we want. <laughs> Makes sense. Uh, but he's right. Uh, we can't do, we can't do backflips in competitive skating. It's, it's usually something that happens later on in shows, which is another reason why I just totally enjoyed, um, being a performing artist now is because there aren't rules and we're really encouraged to, to innovate and try new things. And um, you see so much crazy stuff in, in the show world. It's, it's, it's mind blowing. Wow. And now we have other questions, but for those of you who put them in the chat, if you want to actually speak to Madeline uh, yourself, why don't we try that instead of me asking the question, just mm -hmm. so you get a chance to speak to Madeline. So any one of you posted a question or something else, just unmute yourself and go ahead and start uh, asking the question. Okay, people not, might not be comfortable sharing. That's all right. Okay, so we'll all read the questions then. We, we tried. So from <laughs> Eli, how do you keep your crew moral high when everything seems to be bleak? A happy crew is a productive one, so how do you make sure you are all happy? That's a great question. Um, 
and this to me brings into mind when when we did our premiere um, you saw in the video our show directors Seb and Shana um, they were amazing leaders for us when uh, we put the show together they were the minds behind the show and they're just really incredible people um, but they did their big big speeches um, when they left us so once we go on tour they're no longer with us they kind of release the baby out into the wild but one thing they said to us was you're a family and that's what's going to matter most when you look back at this so take care of each other they just really stressed this um type of like or this idea of just being a tight-knit group on the road because when you're traveling you're away from your family you're away from your loved ones and you're going city to city each week so i would really say we had an awesome um, we had a good relationships between each other so that when things got hard, it was just at least we all got along and you could really feel that on stage, um, even when things were hard. Oh, you're muted. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> I would guess that's so important, especially because you spend a lot of time together and you're on the road together. So I would. I would think that's really important. I, I'm, I'm for all of you out there, as I'm sure you've seen. So Madeline is a really natural speaker and so articulate, and obviously so great at sharing your story. So can you talk a little bit about um, what you were thinking of doing, maybe since you have this natural gift to share your story? Right. Um, so it was actually while I was in. It was um, when I was sent back to Montreal in the summer. Um, one of the things I value is education. So I haven't had time to um, do a lot of schooling because I've been on the road and on tour and performing. Uh, so one of the things I took advantage of since I was injured was getting my education and taking classes. So um, I took a public speaking class at McGill um, through the School of um, Continuing Studies. And that was one of the skills I have been and I'm wanting to develop, which is is speaking and sharing my story and um, in other ways inspiring people because what we do on stage through um, through our art, through what we do, um, is one way to inspire, but so is speaking. So I really have just been diving into this and um, doing my best to refine the skill since taking that class. So it's been a really, really cool um journey so far in, in developing that well you look like you've been doing this your whole life and you have such <laughs> you have a maturity and a wisdom about you and uh, it's very interesting and i what did you study madeline um you said you didn't have a lot of time for education but i know that you studied something wildly different than uh, than what it is that you're that you ended up doing um so i actually initially so when i turned 18 i went straight into the shows so i didn't go for my traditional bachelor's um, but some of my, so I've acquired certificates along the years. So um, I have a certificate in personal training, nutrition, um, and now storytelling through NYU, which is more oral storytelling and, um, and, and writing as well. Uh, so those are some of the, the credentials I've picked up along the way. Amazing. And you're so young and you've already done so much and dabbled in so many different things. So this is phenomenal. I'll go back to a question from the audience. What does one weigh in consideration of doing dangerous work? Is there is the idea, especially since you were injured, I imagine, is the idea of going back after an injury particularly scary? It's not. It is in a way and it's not. So I guess that's not very clear of a response. So I guess the first part of the question was about doing dangerous work. Um, I was not really exposed to a lot of per se dangerous work when you think of being in heights until I joined Cirque and I was amazed at the safety protocols and the preparation that goes into doing these types of, of stunts, um, especially for the aerialist and the people that are, you know, launching up in the air 40 feet um, and landing on a little pad that still <laughs> that blows my mind. Um, but these guys are trained. They have been doing this type of thing their whole life. So if, if they're scared or uncomfortable in any way, I don't think they do it. So they train to the point where it's not scary anymore. And they know for a fact that everything's going to be, everything's going to be okay. 
So that's what I would say as far as things being dangerous is that every, every variable is accounted for. Um, as far as it being scary coming back from an injury, I will say there is, there is a little bit of that because you have a lot of doubt. You don't know if um, your leg is gonna be the same as it was. Um, so that for me, my approach is just taking baby, baby, baby steps. Try a little bit one day. Okay, that was all right. A little bit the next day. So it's all about this, this slow progression of staying in the process and just taking the tiny little steps each day to, to getting back to where you were. And the body is amazing. The body heals and bounces back, even if it takes a little bit longer than you want it to. It, 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 it gets better. And the only re the reason I'm saying that now is I'm still going through this injury was because I've, I tore my ACL once. And I remember thinking this, I was thinking, oh gosh, I'm never going to get better. And a year and a half later, I felt good. So it's time and patience. <laughs> I was going to say patience must really play into this because a year and a half in hindsight might not seem long, but I can't imagine what it was like during. Yes. Does that, act, you know, every day must have felt like a, a long time, I'm sure. <laughs> mm -hmm. So we have more questions, but actually I was wondering if you had any questions for us. So if there's something uh, you want to ask any people in our audience. Um, of course. That's actually, um, so I guess my um, question is, is was, was there anything today that stood out to you as far as you knew coming into this presentation that it was going to be about resilience. You knew I was an artist with Cirque du Soleil, but was there anything in particular that stuck out as far as you learned or something that you hadn't heard before? And everyone feel free to either chat that or just speak up. Don't, don't worry about speaking up. Unmute your mic and just start talking or just put it in the chat. So something that was surprised you or maybe even a, an aha moment from Madeline's talk today. And feel free to share. I'm also talking looking at the comments now. That topic. Oh, so Nick Niloy says, yes, talking about a negative or sad topic in such a positive way. I agree. Do you have anything to say about that? Yeah, I mean, that's one of the one of the aspects we touched on about when you're driving is being positive. I, I cannot stress enough how important that is. It's just being positive and you have the power to like, if something bad happens, you can always control it. And as far as um not control it, but change your perspective on it. There's always a silver lining and there's always a, a different side of the coin. So I think that's a, um, a, a character trait of resilient people that they're able to always see the positive in things that happen. Yeah, and you know, sometimes I know people hear that and they think, oh yeah, positivity, but I love that we have, you know, a firsthand example of somebody telling you, somebody telling everyone that no, that is actually crucial, right? Mm -hmm, totally. Um, now, I think this is a good place to end on the note of positivity, but uh, Madeline, would you like to open your chat? Because I maybe if everybody would like to say anything to Madeline, I personally would like to thank you sincerely for being with us today. Um, I'm honored to be here. Thank oh, you. Thank you. It was, it was wonderful. I love the videos and I think you really um, created a mood, uh, which I hope carries on in the day. And I hope people learned a lot about resilience and here are some comments there. So I'll let those scroll while we continue to say goodbye. But um, good luck, whether it's in your speaking or your coaching, but obviously you have the uh, success formula that you're going to keep applying no matter what. And it was a, a distinct pleasure to have you here today. Thank you for having me. And I hope, I hope you all enjoyed it. And, and yeah, thanks again. It's an honor. Wonderful. Oh, yeah, somebody speaking. Go ahead. Oh, we can't hear you well for a technical reason. So if you have a second to type it or else we were, um, you can contact Madeline directly. She said that was okay. So again, it's Madeline underscore Stammen for her Instagram and Madeline Stammen at uh, www.madelinestammen at, at uh, yeah.com. So mm -hmm. thank you very much again. Thank you everybody for being here. We hope to see you at other events to, uh, going on until Saturday. If somebody from my team could post the website, that would be great. So you can check out other talks and workshops, but um, we created this for, our, for everybody to share. And Madeline, we invite you to other topics as well. And it, it was I'm going. A, 
love you. And if you're as starstruck as I am, then you can follow Madeline. <laughs> Not stop, follow. But thanks again. And enjoy the rest Thank of you. the day. Okay. <laughs> bye.